Good evening. My name is Avinom Pat, and I'm the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut, where I serve as Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life. I am delighted to welcome you to our lecture this evening with Professor Ayelet Brin on advice columns and the making of the American Yiddish press. Uh, you can see that I've chosen uh, a Yiddish press background behind me. It's actually a, an image that comes from the Jewish DP camps of a kiosk of the Yiddish press. Um, so I'm very excited to uh, not only welcome Professor Ayelet Brin, uh, who, as you'll hear in a moment, is the uh, the new uh, Philip D. Feltman Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford. Um, it turns out, I, we're actually related in some way because I used to be the Feltman Professor. So it's really exciting for me to welcome you as, as the Feltman Professor. Um, before I, uh, I formally introduce Ayelet and before we hear the lecture, I just want to mention a couple of upcoming programs that I think will be of, of interest to our community. Um, some of you might be familiar with the very active events calendar that the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies holds every year. There's a what looks like a fascinating lecture that is coming up on Monday, February 13th, a very timely conversation about anti-Semitism in American history with Professor Kirsten Vermegle, who's a professor of history and Jewish studies at Michigan State University. So um, you can see on the Greenberg Center site how to register for that event on Monday, February 13th at 7 p.m. And I just wanna mention the uh, Yukon Center for Judaic Studies is a community partner in the Hartford Jewish Film Festival, uh, which will be coming up uh, quite soon uh, here at the end of March, um, middle to the end of March. So you can learn about uh, the films which will be screening at the this year's Hartford Jewish Film Festival, which will take place from uh, Saturday, March 18th until Sunday, March 26th in person. So I wanna mention that uh, we're trying to bring the film festival back in person again, and then following the uh, week and a half of in-person films, there will also be online films and the um, New Con Center for Judaic Studies is co-sponsoring a number of uh, post-film real talks. So you can check out hjff.org and uh, learn more about the films that will be streaming and be screened in person as part of this year's Hartford Jewish Film Festival. Um, and I wanna welcome uh, both our community members and our students who are joining us uh, for, for tonight's lecture, because as you'll hear, this is a topic which um, directly overlaps with some of the classes that we're offering, including uh, students who are joining us from our American Jewish literature class. So thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. So uh, Professor Ayelet Brin, um, and sorry, one more thing before I introduce Ayelet, just a technical point about how the program is going to run tonight. You'll have noticed that um, you've all been muted. Uh, this is to minimize disruptions during the lecture, um, but we would encourage you, um, we'll have a Q&A and plenty of times for question after Ayelet's lecture. So please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to type in um, any questions that you might want to ask Ayelet and we'll have plenty of time to ask those questions after uh, the lecture. So Professor Ayelet Brin is an assistant professor of Judaic studies and history at the University of Hartford, where she holds the Philip D. Feltman Professorship in Modern Jewish History. After receiving her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 2019, she served as the Rabin Schwidler Joint Postdoctoral Fellow at Fordham University and Columbia University, the Ivan and Nina Ross Family Fellow at the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, and as a scholar in residence at the Hadassah Brandeis Institute. Her first book, A Revolution in Type, Gender and the Making of the American Yiddish Press will be published this fall, I believe in November of 2023, with New York University Press. So it's a real pleasure for me to turn the screen over to uh, the newest Feldman professor, Ayelet Brin. Welcome, Ayelet. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Avi. Can you hear me all right? All good? Perfect. So I'm going to share my screen and then we'll get started.
So I want to start by thanking everyone at UConn Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life and my institutional home, the University of Hartford's Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies, for sponsoring this talk. It's an honor to have been invited to speak, and I look forward to learning together this evening. So today I'm going to be focusing on the intertwined histories of Eastern European Jews who migrated to the United States at the turn of the 20th century and the newspapers that cropped up to serve them. This was a time of profound changes in American Jewish life and also profound changes in American journalism in many different languages. And these transformations were very much interconnected. So I'll be focusing mostly on the development of the Yiddish press newspapers in the language spoken by most Eastern European Jews when they came to the United States. And I'll focus particularly on advice columns and the role of this content in shaping the acculturation processes of readers. I'll also explore what advice columns can tell us about the roles newspapers, newspapers were able to or wanted to play in readers' lives. So I wanna start by asking everyone to think about whether you regularly read advice columns or maybe listen to advice podcasts. So for those who do listen or read advice columns or those who don't but are relatively familiar with the concept, I wanna ask you to think for a moment about why you or people you know enjoy advice columns. Do you read them for advice you can apply to your own life? for a sense of empathy, connection, community, for pure entertainment value, maybe some combination of these impulses. So I'm asking these questions because I wanna prime you to think about the various ways people read and interact with advice columns. And the fact that this is a media that's actually set up to be read by different readers in different ways. So today I wanna to focus on how similar dynamics played out in the turn of the 20th century Yiddish press. Historians and literary scholars have looked to advice columns as sources to reconstruct the lives of Yiddish speaking immigrants. But instead, I wanna to focus tonight on when and why newspapers began to include these columns and what this can tell us about how Yiddish newspapers grew from pretty unpromising origins to becoming central multifaceted institutions in American Jewish life. So first a few words about Yiddish and the Yiddish press. So Yiddish is a vernacular language spoken mainly by Jews of Eastern European descent. It combines elements of Hebrew, Russian, German, and several other languages. There have been people who spoke Yiddish in the United States for centuries, but the number of Yiddish speakers in the United States rose dramatically in the second half of the 19th century, with the beginning of a wave of mass immigration to the United States from Eastern Europe that was strongest between about the 1880s and 1920s. The first Yiddish newspapers in America appeared actually slightly before this wave in the early 1870s. Interestingly, several of these first attempts were funded by the New York-based Democratic political machine Tammany Hall. They saw Yiddish speakers as a largely untapped potential voting base and funded newspapers to try to persuade them to vote for their candidates. So all of these early Yiddish newspapers were pretty unsuccessful and relatively short-lived, usually lasting only a handful of issues or coming out pretty irregularly. It was only beginning in the 1880s and especially the 1890s. And over the course of the next few decades, that Yiddish newspaper publishing in the United States really found its footing. In these years, the number and variety of American publications in Yiddish increased dramatically. So by the 1920s, if you were a Yiddish speaking farmer, housewife, theater goer, humor lover, Marxist, anti-Marxist, you could find a periodical that catered specifically to your interests. But there were also daily newspapers that hoped to attract a more varied audience. Between the 1880s and 1920s, there were 20 attempts to start Yiddish daily newspapers in New York alone. And each of these papers had a specific political or ideological agenda, Orthodox Judaism, socialism, communism, or alignment with the Democratic or Republican parties. But the most successful daily newspapers attempted to court a mass audience, including those outside of their ideological window. So if their paper could reach this broader reading public, they could win out over their rivals in the battles for circulation figures, advertising dollars, and ideological influence. 
And by the 1920s, not only was there a broad market of options for Yiddish readers to choose from, but the circulation of Yiddish newspapers had skyrocketed. The circulation of the most popular Yiddish daily, the Forward, surpassed 200,000 issues at its peak and at times even exceeded that of the New York Times. So this transformation of Yiddish newspapers into successful and essential American Jewish institutions was in no way inevitable. There was no real precedent for Yiddish newspapers on this scale in Eastern Europe when the American Yiddish press began to take off. There were a handful of European Yiddish weeklies and monthlies before the 1880s, but most of them attracted relatively small reading audiences. And because of harsh censorship laws imposed in the Russian Empire, the first European Yiddish daily newspaper did not appear until about 20 years after the founding of the first Yiddish dailies in the United States in the 1880s. Moreover, many Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, especially those who came over before about 1900, had never read newspapers before coming to America. But quickly on their arrival, many Yiddish speaking immigrants began to see newspapers as indispensable parts of their daily lives. They poured over newspapers on their way to work, at home with their families, and out loud with neighbors and friends. They looked to newspapers not only as sources of entertainment and news, but as places to turn for advice on acclimating to American life. For new immigrants, newspapers became trusted friends, advisors, tour guides, and social welfare agencies. So in this talk, I want to particularly highlight the role that advice columns played in this process. These columns were central to the cultivation of a mass Yiddish reading public in America and to situating newspapers as mediators between American and Jewish cultural spheres. Each major Yiddish daily had several advice columns, often running multiple in a single issue. And it was through these columns that newspapers forged personal relationships with readers and that readers began to see newspapers not just as entertaining reading material, but as indispensable parts of their lives. So in particular, I wanna focus on three important roles that advice columns played for Yiddish newspapers and their readers. One, they helped acclimate readers to American life and helped transform Yiddish newspapers themselves into publications in the style of the American popular press. Two, they helped create a sense of virtual community, tying readers close by and further afield to each other and to the newspapers they read. And three, they taught readers not only that newspapers could be a valuable resource, but also how to ask newspapers for the kind of information, guidance, or help that they needed. So because advice columns offered guidance to readers on how to navigate their daily lives, they were central to what scholars have called the Americanization function of the Yiddish press. Americanization is a loaded term implying that there's only one way to become American. But this is actually the word the Yiddish press itself used to describe its relationship with readers. In my talk, I'll usually instead use acculturation, which applies more of a sense of back and forth negotiation between immigrants and surrounding cultural trends. When scholars describe the Yiddish press as an Americanizing agency, like you see here in this title page of a study from the 1920s, they refer to the Yiddish press's self-appointed task of introducing readers to American history, customs, and civic culture, and helping readers negotiate differences between life, religion, or culture in Eastern Europe and America. Newspapers included articles on American history, translations of the Constitution, voting guides before election, and English lessons meant to help readers learn how to speak, read, and write in the major language of their new home country. The educational nature of advice columns made them a crucial component of this function. At the most basic level, most of the questions in advice columns dealt in some way with acclimating to American life. How does one meet a potential spouse, for example, if matchmakers are seen as outdated or backwards? How does one pursue a profession, acquire an education, or get citizenship in the American context? So in addition to exploring these columns in, uh, these themes in advice columns, Yiddish papers also printed etiquette guides that did not respond directly to readers' questions, but instead to a broader sense that readers hungered for guidance on how to adapt to the culture surrounding them. And when viewed in this light, encouraging immigrants to read and rely on Yiddish newspapers 
can be seen in and of itself as a form of acculturation, in that these were cultural practices that many Eastern European Jews took up only after arriving in the United States. For hundreds of thousands of Eastern European immigrants, the process of encountering America was intertwined with the process of becoming reliant on newspapers to interpret American life. But advice columns were equally important to the acculturation of the Yiddish press itself. The most prominent Yiddish dailies became successful by modeling themselves on contemporary American newspapers. Each Yiddish daily had staff members who devoted their time to looking over the pages of English language newspapers, either translating this material into Yiddish or using it as inspiration for new content. I have some sort of humorous examples of this if anyone's interested during the Q&A. So each Yiddish newspaper had a slightly different definition of what defined an American newspaper, but they all agreed on several factors. One, that American newspapers were successful at bringing in a mass audience, including both men and women, and people of different education levels. Two, that American newspapers included entertainment as well as news and advertising as well as ideological content. And three, that American newspapers found ways to forge personal connections with their readers. For the producers of each of these Yiddish dailies, being an American newspaper did not necessarily mean being in English. In fact, they often viewed their Yiddish newspapers as thoroughly American forms of media. So this is a drawing from the 1902 book, The Spirit of the Ghetto. And it takes readers inside the offices of the socialist Yiddish daily, The Forward. The man in front is looking over newspaper pages. There's a man in the background of the image who appears to be asleep. And there are two men behind him on the verge of a fight, whether over socialist ideology or newspaper content, we don't really know. But according to sources on how Yiddish newspapers were composed in this period, it's likely that one of the men in this image or one of his coworkers was actually looking over the pages of an English language newspaper, scanning it for articles to translate to include in the next day's foreword. So one of the lessons that editors of Yiddish dailies gleaned was the importance of a new innovation that was just being introduced at this time to the American press, advice columns. While American newspapers included letters to the editor since at least the 18th century, the modern advice column was actually a product of the 1880s and 1890s. It reflected American newspapers' transformations from political into commercial institutions funded by advertisements and circulation. Instead of inviting readers to write in with their opinions on the news of the day, these columns encourage readers to share private, intimate details about their lives and to view newspapers as advisors to turn to for support and guidance. The interactive nature of these columns was part of newspapers' attempts to build closer relationships with audiences, but it also reflected editors' beliefs that these columns not only helped readers, but contained interesting, engrossing reading material. And Yiddish newspaper editors saw introducing advice columns as a way to bring these same elements into their own newspapers, as well as to make their newspapers more in line with contemporary trends in American journalism. So to illustrate this point, I wanna to turn to the origin story of the most famous Yiddish advice column, A Bintel Brief, as told by its inventor, longtime forward editor, Abraham Kahan. Kahan introduced this column in 1906, nine years after the paper was first founded, and it would go on to provide generations of readers with advice, guidance, and entertainment. And its cultural impact actually continues to this day. It's been the basis of books, plays, and even a recent graphic novel. So in his memoirs, Kahan described the Bindel Brief as the culmination of a long, pretty difficult process of transforming the forward into his vision of a more quote unquote American newspaper. After serving as one of the founders of the paper in 1897, Kahan had left the forward for a five year hiatus where he worked uh, mostly for English language newspapers. While working for the English language press, he had gleaned the value of advice columns and other writing columns as methods to fill newspapers with human interest material and to build relationships with readers. And when he returned to the forward in 1902, he immediately began encouraging readers to write in with stories from their lives. He explained to readers that, quote, 
Many people who have never written anything for print in their lives have good stuff in them, as the Americans call it, end quote. It was just a matter of teaching readers to describe these experiences in the right way. But according to Kahan, he was frustrated in his efforts to coax the sort of material he wanted out of his audience. Try as he might, Kahan could not seem to explain to readers how to transform their life experiences into good newspaper content. The greatest challenge he remembered later was that they could not understand what he meant by interesting. He tried prompting readers with questions like, what is luck or who is more honest, men or women? He also tried to inspire creativity by reframing submissions as true novels as opposed to true events. When these more indirect attempts at curation failed, Kahan wrote editorials explaining why submissions weren't good enough. Get straight to the point, he chided, without asides and without introductions. But after three years of attempts, Kahan discontinued these columns, chalking them up to a noble but failed experiment. So, just, so Kahan described how he had pretty much given up hope when one day in 1906, his secretary came into his office carrying three letters that had arrived out of the blue to the paper's office. Like much of the mail the paper received, these letters sought information from the forward's editors. But their content confused Kahan's secretary. They did not fit the themes usually explored in the newspaper. They did not relate, for example, to socialist ideology or communal issues. So where would they print these letters? And was it even appropriate for a socialist newspaper to publish these windows into readers' private lives? But Kahan was overjoyed. According to his memoirs, these letters represented exactly the type of material he had been asking readers to submit for years with little success. He was particularly taken with one letter where a woman was asking to confront a neighbor through the pages of the foreword. She suspected that this neighbor had stolen and pawned her husband's watch. But instead of expressing anger, the woman described empathy for the poverty that drove her neighbor to steal. So the letter reflected the struggles of workers' lives, which aligned with the paper's socialist principles. But it was also full of emotion, so it served Kahan's desire for engrossing newspaper contents. The fact that it was written by a working class housewife added appeal because Kahan viewed housewives as an underserved reading demographic that he particularly wanted to attract to the foreword at this time. Moreover, according to Kahan, the letter could serve as, quote, an excellent example for other readers. So Kahan decided to print these letters, short responses, and, his, and in his words, an explanation of why they were interesting in the paper under the title A Bintel Brief, which means a bundle of letters. So in Kahan's telling, the origins of a Bintel Brief were a direct result both of authentic out, uh, outpourings of emotion by forward readers and a long, intensive process of encouraging readers to read and respond to the foreword in the way that Kahan wanted them to. He emphasized that these letters had arrived out of the blue after the foreword had discontinued its write-in columns, but also, quote, that it would never have occurred to them to send this sort of letter to the foreword if we had not shown the public all the time that worldly concerns, things full of human interest are important for a newspaper, end quote. By emphasizing the meticulous process that led to this column, Khan underscored his success at teaching his audience to rely on the newspaper for guidance, information, and interesting reading material. So I argue, that the themes Kahan highlighted in this narrative are key to understanding the role advice columns played in the Yiddish press as a whole, not the forward, not just the forward. So while the Bintel Brief is by far the most famous, it was not the only advice column to appear in the Yiddish press. In fact, every American Yiddish daily experimented with a variety of these features. Some were very much like the Bintel in their human interest, reader-driven narratives. Some were much more specific in content, like columns on health care or child care. And these features invited a range of reading and writing practices uh, from their audiences and together forged a complex and layered relationship between the Yiddish press and its readers. So turning back to the Bintel brief, one American advice column, Advice to the Lovelorn, seems to have been a particular source of inspiration for the Bintel Brief. Advice to the Lovelorn was edited by a woman named Marie Manning, better known by her pen name Beatrice Fairfax. 
Her column debuted in a newspaper called The Evening Journal in 1898. And like the Bintel Brief, this column printed reader letters in full, along with responses from Beatrice Fairfax. And the similarities between Cahan's outlook on the Bintel Brief and Manning's outlook on advice to the lovelorn emerge particularly in the striking overlap between the origin stories both authors told about their columns in their memoirs. Similar to Cahan's narrative, in her memoir, Manning described her column as an organic, somewhat spontaneous outgrowth of three letters the Evening Journal received from readers. Like Cahan, Manning was working at her desk when a colleague came to her with three letters that were, in her words, full of genuine human appeal and brimming with the tragedies and comedies of human life. However, she felt they did not fit with the themes explored in the newspaper's existing columns. So like Kahan, she suggested using these letters as the basis of a new department. So both Kahan and Manning's origin stories incorporate narrative strategies that encourage certain understandings of the columns these journalists would go on to write. They even share several common features, including the spontaneous arrival of three letters that were perfectly suited for the type of column they wanted to write. Both also used the words tragedies and comedies to describe these letters. Though Manning's column predated Cahan's by eight years, her memoir was actually published almost two decades after Cahan's. So it's possible her story was influenced by his or perhaps by interviews he gave in English language venues, though this is a little unlikely. It's also possible that Kahan heard or read Manning's narrative from other earlier sources, interviews, or word of mouth. They had some friends in common. And he decided to use it as a template in crafting his own narrative. If nothing else, the similarities between these two narratives suggest certain shared understandings of the appeal of advice columns that pervaded the American journalistic sphere at the time one that privileged advice columns as authentic outpourings of emotion by readers, while at the same time placing them squarely in the field of human interest journalism. So in his introduction to the first Bintel Brief on January 20th, 1906, Khan emphasized the connection between his decision to publish the column and his overall desire to infuse the paper with human interest material in the style of the American popular press. Among the letters which the Ford receives, one finds many that have a genuine, genuine human interest as the American critics call it. We will collect them and print them here from today on with comments or without comments under the name of Bintel Brief." End quote. Again, Kahan also emphasized that letters should not only describe the issues writers faced, but should do so in a way that stoked the interest of other readers. So over the course of its first few months of existence, the Bintel Brief took on the contours it would continue to have for decades to come. The column usually included about one to three letters, sometimes with a summary of their contents at the top, and the themes covered varied from romance to tensions between parents and children, to fights between coworkers, neighbors, or friends. Advice seekers included men and women of a variety of ages, backgrounds, political and religious affiliations, and letters streamed in from those living within close proximity to the paper's offices and around the country, sometimes even around the world. Throughout its run, the Bintel Brief was the purview of two staff members, one who was in charge of choosing which letters to print and one in charge of responding. For its first few years of existence, a man named Leon Gottlieb was the one who sorted through the submissions and quote unquote, corrected the language to make them fit for print, and Gahan wrote the replies. Over time, Kahan became too absorbed with other duties, and other writers took over responding to letters. But since editors did not sign the advice they gave in the Bintel Brief, readers probably still thought they were interacting with Kahan even after he delegated control to other writers. So the way the Bintel Brief functioned behind the scenes reflects several important aspects of the column. First, it highlights the fact that editors did not print every letter they received, but instead carefully selected which letters to print. In his memoir, Kahan stated that most letters that came in were about family matters, love, jealousy, relationships. This suggests that these themes were so present in the column because they were common submission topics. It's impossible to corroborate Kahn's statement since the Ford was not in the habit of keeping submissions once they sorted through them and published them. 
but it is likely that editors had a hand in emphasizing these themes by printing certain letters and not others. This raises lots of interesting questions that we can explore in the Q&A about how we think the newspaper might have curated these letters and what they decided to prioritize when picking what to publish. The second and perhaps thornier issue relates to editors' attempts to correct or rewrite Bintel submissions. Throughout Kahan's career, many Yiddish journalists, especially Kahan's loudest critics, assumed that the improvements editors made to Bintel submissions went far beyond the correction of language and extended either to rewriting submissions or fabricating letters when the forward did not receive letters that fit the themes that Kahan and his staff wanted to explore. In the absence of perfect evidence one way or the other, I'm inclined to believe that the truth lies somewhere between these extremes, with some letters being fabricated, some being real, and most real letters being significantly edited by the forward staff. This view is supported by a dissertation that I found from the 1930s, where a social worker named George Wolf compared original Bintel submissions that editors made available to him with printed versions. Wolf concluded that the editors had based the letters published in the Bintel on actual letters they received from readers, but transformed them so dramatically that it would be a mistake to see these letters as authentic, unmediated expressions of immigrant life. He pointed to editors' tendencies to enhance add or change several features. They often added in stock phrases, amplifying readers' relationship to the forward. Sometimes they reorganized letters to make them easier to read. And they often changed or omitted facts to make stories more interesting or compelling. So Wolf's findings emphasize the fact that a major function of the column was not only to advise, but also to entertain. And this required a process of curating submissions to transform them into reading material for the broader audience. The fact that the Brintel brief was so central to Kahan's attempts to transform the forward into a popular, successful newspaper made it a prime target for many of his harshest critics. For these critics, the column's invitation for readers to air personal grievances to a broader public exemplified everything that was wrong with Kahan's approach to journalism. They also worried that features like the Bintel pandered to the basest instincts of newspaper readers, especially in their opinion, uneducated female newspaper readers and in no way contributed to their enlightenment or political development. So this is an image from the Yiddish humor publication Der Groiser Kundis, which means the big stick which is a publication that very often criticized the forward. So this cartoon lampoons the education work of the forward on the east side. Two of the girls in this image are reading romantic serialized literature that had recently run in the forward, while the third is reading the Bintel Brief. So together, these words in this image critique the forward for claiming to offer readers guidance or practical education, while in reality filling their heads with juicy stories. So the rivals criticized the Bintel brief, saying it catered to readers' basics, basest instincts. Almost every Yiddish daily eventually introduced a column that was meant to mimic the Bintel brief, even those that had critiqued the forward's column. Many imitators particularly emphasized the romantic or gendered nature of the Bintel's appeal. The Orthodox Jewish Daily News instituted a version in 1911, which they called the Groom Bride Question, and later the Groom Bride Letters which dealt only with questions of courtship or marriage. The Day, which was founded in 1914, saw itself as a more intellectual alternative to rival newspapers and remained one of the last holdouts. They worried that an entertaining advice column like the Bintel Brief would go against their aims to elevate the tone of Yiddish journalism. But by 1930, editors felt they could not keep up with the circulation of rival publications without a Bintel-like column, so they introduced one they called Men and Women. In each of these newspapers, including the Forward, human interest tinged advice columns ran at the same time as various other advice and write-in columns that were drastically different in content and tone. Every Yiddish paper printed letters to the editor, as well as advice columns focused on narrow topics, including how to obtain a job, childcare, or health. And many also included a column called the Letterbox, which printed short responses to reader questions without actually reprinting the original letters. 
So these varied columns invited different reading habits from readers. Readers who were looking for more serious or informative guidance could read the forwards column answering union-related question or the day's advice column about civil service exams. Those who were looking for entertainment could read the Bintel or men and women with this in mind. And in addition, editors designed many of these features to be read in multiple ways. Someone could read a letter full of woe and see it as a guide that could help with their own struggles, or they could read it for its entertainment value or some combination of these impulses. The flexibility of this material became more important over time as the reading audience of Yiddish newspapers diversified. After 1905, the first waves of Eastern European immigrants were joined by immigrants who were more likely to have begun to experience secularization or urbanization in Europe and usually had higher levels of literacy. More immigrants arriving in this period had also already begun to read Yiddish newspapers while in Europe, whether American papers imported into the Russian Empire or Eastern Eu European newspapers like Der Freund that appeared after 1903. Unlike previous readers, these readers therefore came to the American Yiddish press with pre-existing expectations about what a newspaper should include. So by diversifying the columns they included, and by including columns that could be read in a variety of ways, the Yiddish press found ways to signal to different kinds of readers that they had their particular interests in mind. So sources from various newspapers suggest that both readers and editors played a part in deciding where and how newspapers responded to letters. Kahan asserted that the forward editors played the central role in deciding which letters would be answered in which columns or not at all. In contrast, unpublished letters that I found in the archives of another Yiddish daily suggest that the decision of where and whether to publish letters sometimes reflected more of an interplay between reader desires and editorial control. Some readers sent letters to a particular department or a particular column, while others asked editors to respond to them privately. At other times, editors sorted letters based on their own criteria. So both editors and readers of the Yiddish press were well aware of the potential entertainment function of advice columns, and editors often selected, sorted, fabricated, or rewrote letters, not only to make sure they were applicable to the problems of the paper's broader audience, but also so that they were as full of human interest as possible. But the entertainment function of these columns in no way negated the crucial role that guidance and advice from newspapers played in the acclimation of new immigrants to American life. Even when advice in the Yiddish press was at its most entertainment driven, it was still meant to serve as a resource to connect readers with each other and with new, new institutions created to meet their needs. In the process, editors encouraged new readers to view newspapers as sources of authoritative information and as participants in shaping American Jewish life. So through advice columns or news coverage, the Yiddish press connected re readers with institutions that were being created to support immigrant needs. They advised readers seeking material aid or help finding lost relatives to seek out charities like the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, HIAS, or the Bureau for Jewish Social Research. They also published specialized columns with advice from lawyers and social workers. This coverage served the dual purpose of connecting readers to resources while also bolstering these new institutions. There was significant overlap between those involved in these institutions and those involved in the Yiddish press. Publishers and staff associated with the Orthodox Jewish Daily News were involved, for example, with the founding of Hyas. So in directing readers to these resources, those involved in the Yiddish press were also reinforcing their own institutional networks or political and ideological visions. In a similar vein, Yiddish newspapers often shaped readers' encounters with America by filtering advice through their political or religious agenda. Lessons on civics compri comprise sample ballots filled out for the Socialist Party in the foreword or suggestions to vote for Tammany Hall or later for Republican candidates in the Jewish Morning Journal. Furthermore, each paper attempted to convey that acculturation was not inconsistent with the specific ideology their newspaper espoused. So for example, in an editorial commemorating the anniversary of the publication of the Jewish Daily News, it highlighted the Americanizing influence the paper exerted, but asserted that in contrast to rival newspapers, their Americanizing influence did not destroy Jewish idealism and the Jewish faith of those seekers after freedom from Russia. 
In this process, writers redefined both acculturation and ideology in ways that made these categories appear more compatible. Attempting to filter guidance through a religious or political lens was a complicated process. For instance, advice columns in the Jewish Daily News sometimes advise readers to seek out rabbinic authorities when they had religious questions, as opposed to relying solely on newspapers for advice. This reflected a desire by newspaper staffs not to let their publication success undermine pre-existing sources of religious authority. Instead, they hoped to use their newspaper to support these authority structures. Moreover, readers' ideologies did not always neatly align with the newspapers they read. Advice seekers in the Bintel brief included those who were religiously observant as well as secular, and readers sometimes took copies of the religious Jewish Morning Journal or Jewish Daily News with them when they attended socialist rallies. So in interpreting America, Yiddish newspapers had to balance their desire to assert a particular political or religious vision and their interest in appealing to as many readers as possible. Through these interactions, newspapers encourage readers to view newspapers as powerful communal institutions and as places to go for advice and aid. Newspapers were quick to highlight readers' responsiveness to these columns through notices apologizing to readers for not responding quickly enough or admonishing readers for not sending the right types of submissions. Newspapers gave the audience the impression that they would not be alone in seeking counsel from their favorite papers. In dozens of articles, Yiddish newspapers highlighted the success of their advice columns in transforming readers' lives. In some articles, these newspapers also stressed the tragic consequences of not following their advice. One forward article, for example, described a murder-suicide where a man killed himself and his beloved after she refused to marry him. The forward revealed that this man had actually written to the Bintel brief a year and a half before, and that he, according to them, was carrying a clipping of the paper's response at the time of his death. If he had followed the paper's advice, the forward asserted, this crime would not have happened, as the paper had counseled him to move on from his unrequited love. So the relationship of the Yiddish press to its readers uh, and to these institutions that they were trying to support was bolstered by their close proximity to one another. By 1910, all of the major Yiddish dailies had offices on Yiddish newspaper Row on East Broadway on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. This not only placed them in close physical proximity to one another, but within a few blocks of many of the institutions created to help immigrants on the Lower East Side, including the Educational Alliance, Young Israel, and Hayes, which all had offices within about four blocks of Yiddish newspaper row. Many readers also lived in close proximity during their first years in the United States. Of the approximately 2 million Jewish immigrants who came to the U.S. between the 1880s and 1920s, 75% of them lived on the Lower East Side for some period of time. The influence of the Yiddish press is in no way just a local story. From the outset, Yiddish newspapers marketed themselves as resources that Jews living in other areas could draw upon to remain tied to Jewish culture or to one another. Some published local editions in larger cities like Chicago or Philadelphia, and in addition, papers received letters from around the country asking for advice, information, and support. Through these interactions, newspapers encourage readers to view them as powerful communal institutions. Um, the claims that the Yiddish press made about the thousands of letters pouring into their office may or may not be reliable, but there is substantial evidence that readers really did begin to see newspapers as playing important active roles in their lives. The first form of evidence was the fact that each of these newspapers had to eventually institute open office hours because so many readers began stopping by in person to ask for advice from the paper staff. Khan referred to these uh, interactions as the spoken bintel, but actually every major Yiddish daily held similar open office hours and even hired staff members who devoted most of their time, most of their time not to writing or editing content for the paper, but to engaging directly with readers. The second form of evidence of readers' responsiveness can be gleaned from unpublished reader letters to the newspaper. The archives of one Yiddish daily, The Day, houses a treasure trove of letters from readers on a variety of topics. Readers sent comments and questions about articles they read in the paper. They added their own words of wisdom to advice doled out by editors in advice columns. They criticized their favorite columnists when they dared to take vacations. 
But they also wrote in with questions that were totally unrelated to the paper's content, asking for travel tips, job recommendations, research assistance, or personal health navigating the immigrant experience. These letters revealed the variety of roles that readers viewed the paper as playing in their lives. Some asked the day to, ask, to act as a sort of information service, answering questions or gathering data. One particularly creative or perhaps desperate reader, Shin Lehrman of Kentucky, viewed the paper as a some mix of personal secretary and cosmopolitan lifeline, asking them to type up handwritten letters in Russian so that he could send them off to their intended recipient. As I live in Kentucky, where one cannot find a Russian typewriter, he explained, I must come to you. Others saw the paper as a matchmaker, asking for dating advice or to be set up with suitable partners. Here's another letter. This is from a young widow named Pauline Friedman. In it, she asked the paper to act as a matchmaker, setting her up with a better class of men than those she was meeting at dances and other events. Like these, this letter, several of these letters credited the day's advice columns for inspiring them to write to the paper. However, many of these letter writers explicitly asked for their letters not to be published, suggesting that readers saw the advisory function of the paper as extending beyond the pages of the paper itself and comprising a personal individual relationship. They expected the day's staff to be able and willing to respond to them directly, no matter what type of question they submitted. So together, these letters reveal a complex, multifaceted, and long-running relationship between the Yiddish press and its readers. Audiences wrote in to or read the paper's various advice columns as a source of entertainment, catharsis, identification, and information, but they also created a relationship with these publications that was informed by but also extended beyond their newspaper reading habits. Because the day, the forward, and other Yiddish newspapers marketed themselves as guides, individual readers began to turn to these papers as advisors, confidants, and teachers on a wide array of subjects. So through introducing advice columns, the Yiddish press drew on American models to become successful publications, as well as central multifaceted authorities in American Jewish life. So now I'll turn to questions and comments, anything that you have. I'd be interested to hear if any of you ever read advice columns in the Yiddish press, or if you had family members who did, or of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that came up over the course of the talk. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Ayelet, for a wonderful lecture. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we can uh, stop the share for now. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> questions. Good. So as you're as you're doing that, um, you can see that I've uh, encouraged you in the uh, in the. Uh, I'll do it this way. I've encouraged you in the chat to please uh, uh, type in your your chat questions, and I don't know if I yell it. Also, it will take advice questions, but you can feel free to type in advice questions I can uh, try. as well. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm, I'm giving you a uh, encouraging a round of applause for an excellent lecture. Really, really uh, fascinating, and quite entertaining. Um, so as we're waiting for for questions to come in, I'll start with the first question, um, which uh, uh, relates to something that you raised. Um, and I'm fascinated by this, uh, the dynamic that you talked about in terms of Americanization versus acculturation and sort of mm -hmm. the, the way in which that worked as a as a two-way street, which it's often, you know, sort of posed as something that the immigrants are um, in this dynamic of, of uh, just slowly becoming American versus looking at this exchange that's taking place between the new immigrants and the society mm -hmm. that they're interacting with. Can you tell us something about um, how uh, the, uh, the, the influence that the Yiddish language press might have had on the English language press? Um, you know this this development or the success that that Abe Kahan in particular, but all the Yiddish papers had with with uh, the advice columns. Do you see sort of that being modeled in the English language press um, as well? The idea that Kahan has of of really wanting to cultivate and create a community of readers and create that personal mm. connection is that something that other papers are trying to to do on their own to sort of for business purposes to have their success, loyal readers. So how does that, how does that work um, in terms of uh, that influence that they have? Yeah, it in different 
uh, moments, uh, the influence goes in different directions, certainly. Um, I think Abe Kahan is a really good example of this. So he works for that five-year period I was talking about in the English language press. But during that time, he does a lot of translating material from the Yiddish press into English so that his readers of the English language press have access to the same material as the immigrants he's talking about. So it's he's actually doing the same thing in reverse as well of the translation that's going on. There are also dozens and dozens of articles in the New York Times and in the um, Christian Science Monitor and all of these newspapers about what's going on in the Yiddish press. So they're all following all of the events in the Yiddish press hungrily. Uh, so there's uh, sort of content that's going back and forth, but also both of these publication spheres are looking at each other very carefully, which is really interesting to think about. Um, there's a there's a question that uh, Herbert Weller uh, typed in mm -hmm. asking, were all the letters legitimate? And you, you referenced sort of the editing that might have happened for entertainment purposes. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, this, the question, first of all, mm -hmm. whether or not they were legitimate? And how we maybe as historians should interpret these, the letters that were printed, um, were they spruced up, were they edited, were they improved? How do we read yeah. them? So it's an interesting and fraught question um, and crucial to think about them as historical sources. We don't have perfect evidence because most of these newspapers did not keep the letters after publishing them, they threw them out. So we don't know whether they're actually based on letters or not. Um, some are definitely based on real letters, just we have like enough evidence to know that based on the specific person whose letter it was being interviewed or whatever. Um, most seem to be either very heavily rewritten or some are definitely fabricated. So I think it's a mix of real letters fabricated letters and sort of reconstrued letters that are very different from the original letter that was submitted. There were also a variety of other forms of mediation. There were lots of illiterate people who had family members or professional letter writers write on their behalves. Um, so then yet again, it's not the authentic voice of the writer. So for me, in terms of how to think of the letters themselves as historical sources, um, I think thinking about them in aggregate as sort of assuming something about what the editors assumed readers would be interested in reading um, is a good approach for thinking about them as opposed to saying that this specific person actually existed and actually faced these problems. These were newspapers that relied heavily on circulation and uh, reader support. So they had to have some assumption that readers are interested in this material, whether for entertainment purposes or for advice to apply to their own lives. So thinking about them in that way. And also, since I study the history of newspapers, thinking about it the opposite way, which is why does a newspaper want to publish this or why does a newspaper want to fabricate this? Um, so those are the kinds of questions that I ask. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I'm struck by this sort of dynamic of the business of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the newspaper itself and then kind of the ideals of the newspaper, which yep. is you know, the forwards, for example, which is kind of like socialism, but a modified form of socialism, but it's still a business, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I found myself wondering, like, what would Abe Kahan say about the paywall, for example? You know, like, what would he think about? He would actually know, be but... fine with it, I think. <laughs> Personally. Yeah. Like he, the newspaper ran on advertisements. Um, there's this big, beautiful building that they built on all of their proceeds in 1912, um, which says something about how sort of financially prosperous there were. On their um, stationery in English at the bottom uh, towards like the mm, 1920s, definitely, it says the forward, the gateway to the Jewish market, which was a way to signal to advertisers that the forward is a great advertising venue. So even though it is a socialist newspaper, advertising was always central to the way they were thinking about things. And that really shapes what's going on ideologically in these newspapers, yeah. Yeah, so interesting, American socialism. Um, uh, there's a question from Professor Amy Weiss here um, who writes, um, uh, thanks Ayala, this was great. Can you say more about the people who are responding to these letters to the editors? Who besides Abe Kahan, for instance, is responding? So what do you know about 
um, the people who are writing the responses. So we have some anecdotal evidence over the years. Um, so we know that Ipahan gave it up relatively quickly. We know his secretary, Leon Gottlieb, did it for a little while as well. Leon Gottlieb was also responsible for most of the serialized fiction in the newspaper and often sort of created serialized fiction that sort of fed on similar themes to the mental brief. So if you're thinking again about curation, there are ways in which they tried to sort of create thematic resonance in the newspaper. Um, and one other person we know that around 1918 was one of the editors is a poet named Mani Leib, who's known as one of the more sort of modernist poets in Yiddish literature. Um, and he did this as his day job and was very dismissive of this work. He wrote letters to his lover at the time, uh, talking about how much he hated working for the Bintel Brief, but modernist poetry doesn't pay the bills and working for the forward does. So he would sort of think about how this was a way to make money as opposed to something he took really seriously, even though for readers, this was a really useful and important and successful venture. So there are various different understandings of it. And there are two moments that I know of where they had women responding to the Bintel Brief, but they responded in a separate column. So one is Rose Pastor Stokes, who was a famous socialist and the later communist agitator. They created a column uh, for a brief period of time where she would respond to certain letters from the Bintel Brief. And then right at the beginning of the Bintel Brief, there is a column by a woman who's called Matilda Luntz. I can't find any biographical information about her, but right at the beginning, there's sort of an attempt to create like separate female and male forms of authority within the newspaper that very quickly breaks down and the Bintel Brief becomes a male space of authority. So that's interesting to think about too. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that with, with some of the questions that I see mm -hmm. coming in about gender and gender dynamics. But um, I'll go to the, the next question that came in from Gay Tuckman who asks, um, I've always been impressed by the Yiddish press's simultaneous encouragement of Americanization and simultaneous warn warnings about the dangers to their lives that Americans posed as portrayed in Robert Park's immigrant press. Um, can mm. you say something about this dynamic then of sort of the, the advice that's given or the, the, the image of America, the, the Sort of effort to try to help the Yiddish-speaking Yiddish immigrants navigate their way into becoming American, while also warning them about the dangers of um, sort of how to do that properly. And here I'm thinking about like um, Abe Gahan's Yekel, for example, which is a great example of like there's a right way and a wrong way to go about um, becoming an American. So you know, uh, to respond to that, like how does the Yiddish press kind of navigate mm. that that tension that the gays are so referring to? It's very dependent on individual writers and individual newspapers. Each had a different understanding of what the right way was. But there is a sense that one of the things to think about is what the surrounding mores of the culture are and how to sort of perform those in a way that's very class-based, like sense of like trying to get Jews to acculturate into middle-class values. There's a really interesting column very early on in Kahan's time in the four where he teaches people how to use a handkerchief. So the idea that like part of being American is that you're supposed to sort of perform gentility, uh, even though this is a socialist newspaper, but there's a sense that there's a fear of how Jews are coming across in surrounding society that's going on there. And in the um, more religiously oriented newspapers, the fear is also about how acculturating into American society might or might not lead people to sort of stray from Jewish practice. So one of the interesting columns is there's this column in one of the Orthodox newspapers that's for young children, uh, originally like eight to 12, and then it uh, goes up to high school as well, which is creating correspondence exchanges for um, young children living in areas where fewer Jews live in an attempt to create a sense of community so that they will not stray from religious observance. So a sense that uh, acculturation can't negate that within these Orthodox newspapers. But the, the fact that the question uh, cited Robert Park's book is especially interesting. 
Um, so Robert Park's Immigrant Press and Its Control was written in the 1920s in response to World War I era sort of fears of immigrant newspapers as sort of fomenting anti-American sentiment. And so the first half of the book is trying to show the positive elements of the immigrant press, including the Yiddish press. But the second half of the book and its control is all about ways in which the government and advertisers can put the right kinds of messages in Yiddish newspapers and other immigrant newspapers. So there's sort of a danger going on in a variety of different ways, which I think is interesting. Yeah, and, and Gabe points out um, this issue that uh, there's the fear also that Gentiles might kill Jews. And so Park mm -hmm. has a quote about carrying a gun, right? As, mm -hmm. I guess a means of self-defense as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, I, I will say it's it's interesting, and you know, someone who studies like the history of the Yiddish press, it, it's interesting to think about the press being segmented according to political ideologies, which we'll all be familiar with in terms of our current media environment, the way in which it's segmented according to political ideologies. But then, this being part of the process of acculturation, that mm -hmm. it's not just becoming American, but it's a specific type of way of negotiating that and a specific vision of how Jews should uh, become part of this society and right. function within it. So mm -hmm. um, two, two questions, I'm gonna fold together two questions. Um, one from Carla uh, that asks about, um, do we know if Ann Landers and Dear Abby were influ influenced by the Yiddish advice columns? Um, which I think is quite interesting because uh, you mentioned the dynamics of gender um, and mm -hmm. sort of creating like a male authority, a female authority. It is quite interesting if we think about the history of advice columns that it, in the American press, it does become quite gendered, I think, right? Yep. Like it's Dear Abby and mm -hmm. uh, Ann Landers. And mm -hmm. that's, so tell us a little bit more about how that unfolds and sort of the the gender dynamics of that. And, and very specifically to Carla's question, mm -hmm. were, did those, emerge in response to the success of the mental brief and Landers and Dear Abby? So I, I don't know specifically, I would imagine so. They were both young Jewish women, their sisters, um, who it seems very likely read these advice columns as well as advice columns in the English language press. Um, and in terms of the gender dynamics, it's this really interesting thing. In the American popular press, this is a very female uh, form of journalism. This is one of the few spaces at the turn of the 20th century where women are allowed to write in journalism. Um, so advice columns, women's columns, there are a couple of other things. Um, etiquette, but when it right? gets, yeah. hmm? what do you say? Like Emily yep. Post. Yeah. So in this early period, it's, it's very circumscribed what women are allowed to write. Um, and when it goes into the Yiddish language press, there are a couple of women who write columns mostly for women and for young children, although many of the women who are writing advice columns in the Yiddish press are actually men, which we can talk about later if people are interested. That's a very common phenomenon, men writing under female pseudonyms. Um, but the most of the successful advice columns at least purport to give advice from a male perspective. And this is where they're playing with this idea of authority. So when they talk about advice columns as entertaining light reading material, they almost always talk about the female audience for these columns. And when they talk about them as authoritative sources of guidance, they talk about the male writers of the columns. So gender becomes a way to sort of cue the line between these two different functions and describe these columns in different ways to appeal to different sort of functions they want the newspapers to take on in readers' lives, which is really interesting. Yeah, great. So, and this this segues uh, nicely into the next question, which came in from Carol, um, who says, can you tell us something about women writers at the time? Mm -hmm. um, we've recently heard about a group of Yiddish women novelists, especially Miriam Karpolov, who, mm -hmm. uh, who I actually knew, Carol writes. So um, just oh. tell us a little bit more, yeah, about that. Uh, well so yeah. I'll start with Miriam Karpilov then. She was also a writer for the Yiddish press. There are a few writers, especially beginning in around 1914, which is when all of the major Yiddish dailies start introducing women's pages for the first time. Before then, there aren't women's pages, but there are a few women who write. But there's a, a huge increase within the number of women who are writing beginning in 1914. 
many of the famous sort of Yiddish literary figures who people have heard of uh, also write women's columns for the Yiddish press. Miriam Karpilov, Anna Margolin is a hugely important Yiddish journalist under her real name, Rosa Lebensboim. Um, but people tend to sort of discount this part of their oeuvre because these women saw these as like silly light articles um, and not as important as their literature. But in reality, these are such interesting, trenchant critiques of gender um, that I think are really worth re-exploring. So Miriam Karpilov uh, wrote this amazing novella, which is being published relatively soon. Jessica Kierzane, the translator, is doing this wonderful translation of it. It's called A Provincial Newspaper. And it's Miriam Karpilov describing within a novel that's very connected to her actual life, her experiences working for a newspaper in Boston, which to her was the provinces because it wasn't New York, and how sort of instrumental they viewed women writers as. The idea that like, you're supposed to just write fun, light things. We don't really care what you write. Um, as long as it has your name on it and as long as it's for women. Uh, and she's like very negative about that. And the same thing is true of Rosa Lebensboim. In her journalism, she talks about all of the double standards that are applied to women in ways that makes it make it very clear that she's talking about the editors of her actual newspaper. Um, so definitely these are wonderful sources for thinking about women in journalism. Yeah, excellent. Really fascinating. Um, uh, so there's uh, Sarah, uh, my colleague Sarah and Sebastian, Sarah Wellen and Sebastian Bogenstein, who are uh, professor at the University of Connecticut in Judaic Studies, ask, um, say, thanks so much. We're curious about the humorous examples you said you could share in the Q&A. So uh, you, you teased us during the yep. talk and you, you mentioned that um, the sort of acculturation of the Yiddish press itself mm -hmm. and sort of copying things from their compressed. So can you tell us a little bit more of that? some of these humorous examples. Uh, of yeah, I have a couple examples I love sharing. Um, so this uh, desire to not only mimic the success of the American popular press, but to actually incorporate content starts very early and often before the journalists have particularly good English language skills. So they're sometimes copying word for word in ways that are very unidiomatic and other times are completely misunderstanding the things they're reading. So one of my favorite examples of this is that uh, this takes place in Philly. There are two weekly newspapers, weekly Yiddish newspapers in Philly that compete to have more sensational headlines than the other one, both borrowing all of this material from the American popular press. So the editor of one of these newspapers opens up the rival and it has this huge headline saying the Empress of China has come to America to look for a husband. And he's so upset that he somehow missed this juicy headline. So he goes back to the English language newspapers that he looked over this last week. He's like, how could I have missed this headline? And it turns out that his rival had misunderstood an advertisement for a ship called the Empress of China, which was going on its maiden voyage and had assumed that this was an actual Empress of China coming to America to look for a husband. And then because he couldn't exactly understand what's going on in the article, just like made up the rest of the article. Uh, and the early Yiddish press is full of things like this, like the desire to translate was sort of preceding the actual ability to understand the language. So the question is, how do you say fake news in Yiddish? That's a great the... question. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. There's a lot of fake news in, in these newspapers. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay, so one one last question. Um, uh, Marshall uh, writes in, just does the forward still have an advice column? Yeah, uh, they do. They still have a mental brief. It's relatively recent that they reintroduced it, but they do. Yeah. Great, great. Um, and I just want to mention, so you showed um, during your talk, you showed Liana Fink's mm -hmm. uh, mental brief uh, graphic graphic novel. Um, so she's actually uh, the recipient of this year's Edward Lewis Wallant Award um, okay. for uh, her, I mean, all of her works are wonderful, but she has a more recent graphic novel called Let There Be Light, um, the story of her creation. So she'll be coming to uh, the Greenberg Center um, to receive the Wallant Award um, at the end of April. Um, so it was nice that you mentioned uh, Liana mm -hmm. Fink as well. Um, I And when I'm done with the recording, I'm going to un unmute everyone if people want to say hello so but i'll stop the recording before we do that so um let's just uh take an opportunity to uh thank uh thank ayelet for a wonderful wonderful uh, program and a wonderful presentation and here i will um 
uh, allow people to unmute, we can give you a round of applause um, for your for your presentation. So thank you for an excellent lecture. Really quite fascinating. I can hear people applauding. And um, uh, we look forward, thank you all for being here this evening. We will look forward to seeing you at future programs. And thank you again, uh, Ayelet, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.